I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and mostly I'm pleased because I get a lot of out of talking to patients. It's interesting to me, Ruben, who's one of my mentors, actually was the one who got me interested in talking to these patient groups. And it's been an incredibly rewarding part of my career. I've learned a lot. Um, and I've learned, a lot. I think I'm a better doctor because of the interactions that I've had with patient groups like this. And I'm quite, um, I think peer education and patient peer education is, uh, patient to doctor education is a really important component of things. So Anne asked me to just said, you know, what are some of the common things that come up in your clinic? What are the common questions that patient asks you? And I will tell you there's three questions that I, when I sat and thought about this, that come up quite a bit. The first question is, I feel fine. Why are you telling me I need to take treatment? The second question is, I feel awful. Why shouldn't I take treatment? And the third question is, um, are you ever gonna cure me? And so I thought we'd sort of take those three questions and Ruben gave you an incredibly great sort of 100,000 view overview of things. Mine's gonna be very personal because I took three of these patients and I thought we could just walk through them and hopefully spur a little of the, how they, they, what they have in common or not in common with you. So um, I just want to reiterate that these are real world problems, which means we're going to be working within those guidelines, right, in the part of the medicine that's the art of medicine, rather than any um, hard and fast rules. My first study is this person, her name is Jennifer. Uh, she's a female administrator. I met her last week, actually. She was referred by her cardiologist because she had had chest pain and she had a stent paste in this left coronary artery, no, not the left, the left anterior descending, which is sort of on the right side of that heart picture. So you can tell if there is a blockage in that part of it, you can, just like a traffic jam, if cars couldn't get past where it says left anterior descending, there would be a big part of the heart that didn't have blood supply, and that's what was happening to her, and that's why she was having some shortness of breath and some jaw pain when she went for her daily walk. So she went to see a cardiologist, and they did an angiogram. They found out that she had that blockage there, and they put a stent in. After they put this stent in, they started her on a number of new medicines. She, she's a Wisconsinite, which means she hadn't seen a doctor in 12 years, um, because people in Wisconsin do not like to go to doctors. And um, the other thing that happened is that they did a blood count. She had high platelets and was found to be positive for this thing that she didn't understand. She said they're positive for not John, but Jack. So uh, that's how she got referred to me. So what are her risk factors for having a, a heart problem? So she's a smoker. Uh, she smoked about a pack a day for about 20 years, and she has hypertension, which she didn't know about again because she hasn't been to the doctor for 12 years. Um, however, since she saw her cardiologist, she's now cut down on her smoking. So um, she's gone from a pack a day to three cigarettes a day. She's on a blood pressure medication. Now she takes an anti-cholesterol medicine, and she takes two anti-platelet medicines. So her life went from taking nothing to taking a lot of medications. And she says to me, you know, I, I, I'm on all these new medicines. Isn't this enough? Haven't I reversed my risk factors enough? I feel fine. Why should I start treatment? So this gets to some of the hard and fast inconvenient truths of even uh, low-level myeloproliferative neoplasms. And this also gets to what Dr. Messa was talking about in terms of risk. So her risk, and how I describe her risk, is mostly from these either arterial clotting events or an, um, venous clotting events. And arterial clotting events are ones that occur in the heart, um, or can occur in the heart, like hers. You can see the buildup of fatty tissue in that blood vessel, and the blood just can't get to the distal part of the heart, so that part of the heart dies, and that's irreversible. What was interesting is that she also didn't recognize that 
this was also a risk factor for her having a stroke. There's two kinds of strokes. One is where an ischemic stroke, where the blood supply doesn't get to the distal part of the brain, and the other is a hemorrhagic stroke. Both of those can occur in individuals with ET or PV, and these are some of the reasons that we get worried. Venous clots everybody's heard about. These include deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And they can also occur in the abdominal vasculature where um, the blood supply to the colon or the intestines can be blocked. And it can also occur in brain drainage. So these are common, not common, but these are, when we talk about the impact that these conditions have on our lives, arterial and venous clots are two of those. And they do happen both at diagnosis. Many people with ET, about 30% of people with ET, arrive at their diagnosis because they've had one of these clotting events, PV as well. And then at sometimes after you've been diagnosed, these can happen in a variety of risks uh, timing as well. And they also happen in younger individuals and show you that having these diseases increase your risks for mortality because of these clots. So cardiovascular disease in patients with MPNs is much higher. That doesn't mean you're 90% likely to have cardiovascular events, but it's nine times what you might have otherwise. And strokes um, and, compare, and the uh, development of solid tumors. So these are not something to uh, sort of blow off. And the question is, why are they more common? And this, Dr. Ritchie's gonna get into uh, in a little bit more detail, but they come from a variety of reasons. One is an elevation in the red blood cell counts, and that's why people with polycythemia vera, for example, get phlebotomies to make sure that we keep their red blood cell count at a better level. Uh, elevation in white blood cell count. We've heard a gentleman here this morning talk about his white cell count going up a little. Uh, as Dr. Messa mentioned, this increase in the abnormal interaction between the blood and blood vessels seems to be more consistent when the white blood cell count is above the level of normal over a given period of time. And maybe what, one of the reasons why medicines like hydrea help prevent those problems is that it lowers that white blood cell count. And the last is these interactions with, of the JAK mutation. And so I try and explain to people that the blood cells that grow up with this JAK mutation, they just don't interact with the blood and blood vessels as well as, the, as cells that grow up from a clone that does not have that JAK2 mutated. So what was my recommendation for this patient? Um, first off, she still hasn't gotten a diagnosis. Um, she'd not had a bone marrow biopsy when she was sent to me. And so one of the things that I have to keep remembering and reminding myself is that even when somebody's sent to me with, you know, high platelets and a JAK2 mutation, for example, that doesn't constitute a full diagnosis. And so in, we usually go back and I explain what diagnostics mean and why people need a bone marrow biopsy. And for this lady, we wanted to make sure we excluded other causes of uh, that she does she really have essential thrombocythemia, or could this be early myelofibrosis? Would that change the way I manage her, et cetera? So we do, I always go to, back to the big basics, and we always start with diagnosis. Now the next thing I talk to her is once we had a diagnosis, which we did, and confirmed that she has essential thrombocythemia, we then talk about risk benefit. And in essential thrombocythemia, as Dr. Messa pointed out, Prospective clinical trials show that hydroxyurea decreases the risk for thrombosis compared to people who take placebo instead of hydroxyurea. That's very old data, but we do think that when you're looking at total end of the line outcome of being arterial or venous thrombosis, hydroxyurea is helpful. We also know that hydroxyurea plus aspirin is better than an agrolide plus aspirin for this outcome of arterial thrombosis. And so there is, while there are some recent trials that show equivalence, when I was discussing with her treatments, I was discussing hydroxyurea as something that would be first line to prevent additional arterial thrombosis. I also talked about the fact that the mutation that she has in her ET is associated with higher rates of thrombosis 
compared to people with essential thrombocythemia who are JAK2 negative. So we went over this data in the clinic, and I showed her this chart just to explain a little bit how her uh, essential thrombocythemia is somewhat defined by the mutation that she has. Her platelet count might not always be as high as other kinds of uh, um, essential thrombocythemia, but she does have an increased risk of vas vascular risk. And there's multiple studies that compare CalR mutated essential thrombocythemia and JAK2 looking backwards, and they've showed that JAK2 itself is this increased risk for thrombo thrombosis, both in the arterial and venous kind. So then we went to recommendations, and I often, Dr. Messer told you guys about these NCCN guidelines, and I often actually pull those out with the patient, and I go over them, and I say, so here we are, you're in a high risk category, and so our guidelines are that you should be not only monitored for new thrombosis, and we need to get your cardiovascular risk factors down, and that's what's already happened. You've already had these new medicines to modify your cardiovascular risk. However, we also need to decrease that white cell count. We need to decrease that platelet count using hydroxyurea, interferon, or anagrelide. And then we talk about the plus minuses of those drugs. So this lady uh, started on hydroxyurea. We're aiming to get her white count from 900 closer to the normal range. She's been on the drug for about, I don't know, maybe a month now. I think I saw her, I think I saw her two months ago and she's been on the drug for about a month now. And she's like, you know, I feel, I don't feel bad. And I said, good, that's, that's what we want. We want this disease not to impact your life. And most importantly, we don't want you to have another stroke or another heart attack. Uh, we don't want you to have a, another heart attack or an additional stroke. The biggest impact I can make on her life though is still in that managing cardiovascular risk factors. So I've, really been pushing her about stopping smoking completely, telling her that just going down from a pack to a half a pack is not nearly as important as every moment she can be completely off of cigarettes. All right, the next patient is Beverly. Uh, this lady is a 48-year-old teacher. Uh, she presented with an elevated white blood cell count, elevated platelets. Her hemoglobin was in the normal range, but she was pretty significantly iron deficient and she had a mildly enlarged spleen. So this also is not uncommon in a woman who is still, pre, uh, still um, menstruating, as Dr. Messa pointed out, to have a diagnosis of polycythemia vera, which was most consistent in the bone marrow biopsy, even though her hemoglobin was not radically increased. Um, and what we found is that she was JAK mutation positive, we tested her for this thing called the BCR able mutation, which rules out a diagnosis called chronic myelogenous leukemia, and her EPO level, erythropoietin level, was low. So these are the categories of things that we look at it when we do a bone marrow biopsy to, again, make sure we have that diagnosis. So she was uh, started on aspirin, and she uh, needed phlebotomy only occasionally to keep her hematocrit under about 43%. So one question that that brings up is, what is the appropriate hematocrit for an individual with polycythemia vera? Many of you may have heard of this study that was published in the New England Journal that looked at how intense our control of blood counts needs to be for polycythemia vera. In this study, a number of uh, Italian researchers who've done incredible work in the world of MPNs randomized people to keep, peop to keep individuals uh, blood counts under 45%, their hematocrit under 45%, or their hematocrit between 45 and 50%. And they asked the questions in this randomization, which group developed more arterial and venous clots, which groups experienced more bleeding episode, and which group developed myelofibrosis or leukemia more readily? Did it matter how often you were kept under, uh, how tight the control of your blood counts were. And the way that the blood counts were kept under control was either phlebotomy or phlebotomy plus hydroxyurea. And what they showed is that those who were in the higher hematocrit group had 9.8% of events, meaning an, a heart attack, a stroke, a pulmonary embolism, 
uh, or uh, even death from one of those, versus in the lower hematocrit group, only 2.7%. Now that's pretty remarkable in uh, that they only had 365 patients on this study. They found that there were no significant differences in the development of myelodysplastic syndrome or AML or bleeding. So in a patient with polycythemia vera, we know from this data that we should be aiming to keep the people's uh, hematocrit under 45%. Now I tend in women to try for a little lower than that. I try for about 43% and that's because there's in women generally uh, a lower level of hemoglobin and I kind of look at their other blood parameters and aim for a little bit lower. So this woman was on phlebotomy and aspirin and she saw me for a year or so and she just feels awful. She has fatigue over the last year. She describes this as feeling so run down at night that she just collapses. She thought maybe this was because she was going through premenopause. She'd been on iron tablets before and had felt a little better on those, but she took she stopped those when the medication when she was diagnosed with the MPNs. And this is a common thing: is if somebody's iron deficient and feeling, um, it could we blame their fatigue on iron deficiency? We actually, I don't often, but I gave her a trial of a few uh, days of iron tablets a week to see if that helped her fatigue at all. It didn't particularly. She still got to the point where, you know, she had three children and she was coming home at five o'clock from work and she could barely make dinner. Uh, she had some of these migraines also that were off and on and occurring twice a week. So she really felt particularly bad and we tried to, to deal with her fatigue in a number of ways, and some of those ways you've heard about today. Um, she had, I don't know if, I wasn't here this morning, you may have seen this, it's called a spiderweb graph, and it, just that outer line looks at a little bit about how symptomatic, the difference between the inner line and the outer line shows some of the differences in, in the symptoms that people have over individuals without MPN, and really shows that Fatigue is one of those main symptoms. In fact, if you looked at Dr. Messa's heat map of symptoms, there's this red line that goes all the way across. That was fatigue. This is a very common com um, component of having these, these conditions. We know that women have a little bit lower rates of uh, having low platelets, but much higher rates of fatigue, and also higher rates of migraines, and a condition called erythromyalgia, which is a burning, uh, sensation from the inside, often in the feet or the toes, uh, sometimes in the legs in general, can be quite debilitating for individuals. This is the MPN symptom assessment form, and this is the version that we use in my clinic. So when I see a new patient, I have them fill this out, and then intermittently I have them repeated, especially when we've started a new treatment, and that helps me judge in a, we can go back and say, well, this is what you felt like before, and this is what you felt like now. It helps kind of ground us with a diary of how that, and this is what's developed, but it's developed by Dr. Messa and Dr. Sherber and others to really make sure we keep track of people's symptoms. If you're not doing this in your clinic, you can download this off the internet and just keep it in your own, keep it for yourself as well and bring it into your doctor and say, look, this medicine isn't working for me and this is how I know. So this lady, um, we did, we, uh, she's up to date on her phlebotomies, her hemoglobin was well controlled. She just, by Wednesday, she's falling asleep early. She was talking about going back to part time on her job. She was uh, exercising well regularly. We talked about diet. We talked about all these ancillary things that she could do. Exercise, we tried Ritalin for a while. That didn't help. She did some diet changes. So we, I felt like we really went all the way through until we decided that it was time to start cytoreductive therapy. And we went over the risks and benefits of pegylated interferon, and we started pegylated interferon. On the basis of this, so this is, um, we saw that in patients on, uh, we went over this trial of patients with pegylated interferon and polycythemia vera. Some of those patients had their JAK2 mutation disappear, and many of them experienced a complete hematologic response. I was not as interested in doing her endpoint for her treatment wasn't so much about the hematologic response, but could it get at the root of her fatigue?
So we did that SAF symptom, uh, symptom assessment form, and then we started her on polycy or we started her on pegylated interferon. And um, we do, when I talk about interferons, I sort of think, when I look at those, I think about what are the benefits of interferons as well as the risks. And in her, we talked about control of the proliferation, possibly a decrease in thrombosis risk, and this anticlonal activity, could that make a difference in her fatigue? We talked about the fact that it has some impact on short-term quality of life. Some people feel exhausted after they take it. In some people, it's worsened fatigue. She did not have a history of uh, depression, but in some people, it can worsen depression to the point of suicidality, actually, although less so in this pegylated form than in the high-dose form, so we talked about that. And we talked about the fact that in some individuals, we do it earlier on in the disease course. I was not considering hydroxyurea ruxolitinib for her at this point because she had early disease. There are some individuals who advocate for interferon for all newly diagnosed polycythemia patients. I do not do that in my clinic, but when people have a disease that's impacting on their quality of life, even if they're not on their high, in the high risk group, then I will entertain starting interferon, as in this individual. So she started at 45 micrograms once a week. We then um, went up to 90 micrograms, and uh, that's what she remains on now. And this is uh, the clinic note that I did on her two weeks after she started. She feels tired and achy with a little bit of nausea for 25 hours after the injection, but overall feels better than she has in months. She went from to thinking she needed to take go to part-time to now not only working full-time, but also participating in her child's PTA. And she now teaches a yoga class at the cancer center uh, uh, north in northern Wisconsin where she lives for people that have cancer. So her fatigue has improved very significantly. Now she hasn't need any additional phlebotomies and uh, over time her iron level has slowly gone up mostly just with dietary supplement. I don't know if that's helped as well but I think controlling her blood counts without any need for phlebotomies at all has been helpful. So I sort of wish I, I treat I worked with this woman for about two and a half years before I started the interferon. And some of parts of me want, wishes I'd started a little earlier. We just tried really to deal with fatigue without, um, in, without doing interventions. Now that being said, I've had plenty of people that I've started interferon with and they feel much worse. So really it's an individual by individual thing and that's why keeping that symptom diary was really helpful for us. The last patient is a 67 year old lady. Oops. She's in general good health. Uh, she did some water aerobics and pretty, was doing pretty well when she noticed over about six months worsening fatigue and then itching. Um, and the itching would wake her up at night. Um, and her workup demonstrated an increase in her white blood cell count, a little bit of anemia, and a little bit of a thrombocytopenia, so low platelets. And then she had an enlarged spleen on physical exam. And so we diagnosed her with, after a bone marrow biopsy, with myelofibrosis. And her question is, can you cure me? And so again, we went back to the basics. Uh, how certain am I of the true diagnosis? And again, myelofibrosis, you need a bone marrow biopsy. You need to, in general, we do a molecular panel as well to understand exactly what are the molecular findings in that given bone marrow. Um, and I also make sure I rule out other things, myelodysplastic syndrome, CM, there are some chronic leukemias can look at that. So when she came to see me, the first thing is, let's make sure we're certain of this diagnosis. And then we need to move into something that, again, Dr. Messer referred to called risk stratification. There's a lot of different ways you can stratify people with myelofibrosis, and you need to pick the risk stratification that's most appropriate for the endpoints you're looking at. Are we talking about the possibility of a transplant in you, in which case we use a certain kind of risk stratification method? And finally, what about treatment? So 
as you guys have heard, and I'm sure multiple times today, myelofibrosis is a disease with a huge spectrum. Some people have myelofibrosis and don't even know it. They are in early stage. They have a few uh, changes to the way their bone marrow looks, a little bit of fibrosis, but they're not particularly symptomatic. Over time, though, myelofibrosis progresses, and then you can have some additional stem cell mutations, sometimes a little bit more reactive disease in the marrow, which can then release these cytokines to your body, causing more fatigue and a little bit more symptoms. And then over time, you get more mutations. It's almost like that bone marrow has become more vulnerable. You can have an increased number of blasts at times, anemia, and constitutional symptoms. This patient, I believe, had had myelofibrosis for a while, but it was really only once it became symptomatic. She was well compensated. When it became symptomatic is when she started to notice the itching and she started to notice this fatigue. So she was pretty much closer to the red part of this by the time she was diagnosed. So there's, as I say, a lot of different ways that you can do the, um, the risk stratification. They include things like people's age, whether or not they're having symptoms, and these symptoms include things like night sweats and fevers, whether or not they're anemic or have a high white count, whether or not their platelet count has gone down, and then things that you can find in their molecular mutations like their karyotype. That's something that we do on the bone marrow biopsy. And you've seen graphs like this before. Once you get a risk stratification, then you can sort of um, do some kind of a crystal ball analysis, say, well, in large groups of people that have these characteristics, the average life expectancy falls here, here, or here. And there's a number, as I say, a number of these. The most recent is one called the MIPSS70. Uh, that uses some of these same things as well as some clinical factors and helps us sit down with a patient and say, based on everything we know, this is in the ballpark what I can say might happen to you. Now, many people either uh, their disease is more aggressive, and also many people, their disease is less aggressive. So it's very hard to be extremely um, accurate with these. I think of it more as just getting a gestalt. But at least that gestalt then helps us understand treatment choices. And this is a, a kind of a graph that I sit down with people and I say, first we need to attempt our to figure out what our cures are, or what our goals are. Are we going to attempt a cure? Are we just going to work on your getting your spleen under control, getting your symptoms under control, possibly increasing the length of your life even with the disease, or are we going to just work on controlling your symptoms and your blood counts? For each of these, we have some possible interventions. Each of those interventions has some pluses and minuses with them. If I decide to go to transplant, this is a high risk to procedure that may have uh, high toxicities associated with it. But it also has the one, it's the one uh, procedure that we know right now may be able to permanently re reverse what's happening in the bone marrow. If we're gonna take that off the table or that's not something you want, what about some clinical trials we might have? Or using something like ruxolitinib or fedratinib to control symptoms. These have much lower toxicities. Is that really more in keeping with your values and your goals as a patient? Or do you just want, do we just have some symptoms and some blood counts do we, we need to control? So there's no right answer here. Um, in this individual, she was in her 60s, 68 I think, and she was absolutely interested in hearing about whether or not a transplant was for her. I referred her to a transplant doctor, and after going through that, she decided that wasn't for her, at least not at this stage, and so we ended up enrolling her in a clinical trial for newly diagnosed myelofibrosis patients. But again, Again, that was a value-based decision. There's no right answer here. This is the panel of choices that you should be thinking about, and you should be applying medicine to your goals, not the opposite way around. So the last thing I want to say is, and this didn't come out that well because I used white there, but I just want to say that you are the key intermediary between the people that take care of you. Your primary care doctor, your cardiologist, your neurologist, they may know a lot about you. 
your hematologist may have a lot of information about disease, and you sit at the center of that nexus. So one of the things I think is most important is for you to be extremely aggressive about making sure that your doctors talk to one another. That doesn't always happen. Doctors don't always read the electronic chart of other doctors from other places, but to the extent that you can, get your doctor's contact information, their email, say, doctor, this isn't for me, This I want to give this to my cardiologist so they can call you. Um, and I often find that this individual communication between the physicians taking care of that patient really ends up having a good benefit. And that me, that's true no matter what level of disease that you have. So I just wanted to end on that note because I think most problems in this world happen because we don't communicate well enough. And the way to change that is just to step up and say, I'd like to be part of that. So um, I'm going to end there. I just wanted to make sure we get these take-home messages, ask questions. Events like this are incredibly good for that. But also ask questions of your doctor. Don't be afraid to get a second opinion. Consider clinical trials. There's some new drugs coming out that may be particularly um, interesting for these. And don't expect clarity on every decision, but you should expect clarity in the way decisions are made. So we may not know the perfect thing, but you should know how that decision came to be, and you should be part of that decision. Um, and with that, I'll just end. Thanks to Anne and Kathleen for such a great event, and I'll be around to take any questions. Thank you.